Welcome to my YouTube channel where we demonstrate and discuss everything related to theatrical and entertainment production crafts. Please subscribe to get the latest updates, posts, and demonstrations. While I will focus primarily on safety in the shops and comprehensive training and operating procedures for tools and machinery, I'll also demonstrate and discuss practical applications like flat and platform construction, scene painting, and more. If you'd like to see something specific, please let me know in the comments. Once again, please subscribe and power up the alert bell to get the most up-to-date notifications about new content. As a reminder, always seek out training from the shop supervisor or the technical director before attempting any task or demonstrations in this video. If you have never performed a task that I discuss or demonstrate, especially if it is one of the more advanced tasks or operations, you should only attempt them under the supervision of the shop supervisor or the technical director, especially if it is your first time doing so. If you haven't done something recently or would like a refresher, ask to be retrained or have the shop supervisor or technical director supervise you performing the task. As always, be safe in the shops, on stage or backstage, or in the production support areas. One of the questions I don't think gets discussed very much is what do you do when you have a really cheap or underpowered table saw and you need to kind of push it beyond its limits. Not everyone can afford a cabinet saw, nor do they have space for a cabinet saw. Not everyone has space for a big outfeed table or a large, you know, extension of your table for more complex cabinet making. A lot of people just have a small job site table saw similar to this, and maybe not even as much power as this, and they've got to make do. What do you do when you have to do something like uh, rip a piece of two by six or rip a piece of hardwood two by six. And that's what I'm gonna get into today. I have some things that I do to compensate for that. I wanna point out that there are several things that I am doing here with my home machine. I'm not at work, so I am doing some things that are not safe. I don't have a guard on the machine and I don't have a riving knife. The guard that comes with this 1970s era table saw is the kind where the splitter is built into the guard. And it's just a big pain in the butt guard to work with. It gets knocked out of alignment and they're just frustrating, as is this really, really stupid ripping fence that came with the machine. But it still does good work. It just is a little bit more of a pain in the butt to line things up and to tidy things up. Ripping is always best when you have the riving knife in place but I can't really do a separate riving knife without using the uh, manufactured guard. And I do this at home. I claim full responsibility for the risk to my health and life and safety. Don't use a table saw without a riving knife and use the guard whenever it is possible to use the guard. The guard would be possible for this cut. I should be using the guard. The other thing I'm going to be doing that is considered unsafe is I don't have an outfeed table. So the way I handle that at home with I'm working a big piece of plywood or I'm working a, uh, a long stick of lumber is that I'll push it about halfway through and then I will run around the backside and I'll pull it the rest of the way. That is considered a dangerous way to operate the table saw. So I don't recommend that. It's better to have a catcher and someone to catch and help support it. I don't have that while I'm recording this video. So I'm going to do it the unsafe way, don't do what I do. The other reason not to do that when you're pulling the lumber is you don't have as much control of keeping it up against the fence. And that can increase the risk of kickback, that can increase the inaccuracy of your cut if the wood is wobbling a lot. And it's gonna make your, your cut not sufficient for what you need if it's a real precise cut. Because I don't have a guard on this, I always, always, always retract the blade back into the table when I'm done with it at the end of the workday. And that uh, helps protect me or anyone else from coming across the blade that's sticking up without a guard to protect it from getting scratched. I have cats, they like to sleep on the table saw uh, when I'm not using it. So even when I use it and I walk away, 
I will take the blade down so the cats don't get scratched by the saw blade. It's not normally plugged in when it's in storage and I put a towel over the top so it's a little more comfortable for the cats. But uh, there goes one of the cats right now. If you're not going to have your guard on your machine, I would always recommend you get in the habit of putting that blade below the surface of the table at the end of every day that you're using it. And even throughout the day, if you're stepping away from the machine for a period of time, just take it down in there. That's gonna be safe for you. That's gonna be safe for everyone else who's in and around the shop. The exposed blade isn't going to be a hazard in general in the shop. I don't know how many horsepower this is, but I don't think it's probably much more than a one and a half horsepower, if even that much. I looked at the labels on it. It doesn't say anywhere what the horsepower is. When I was a student in undergrad doing theater, we had a similar craftsman type table saw as the table saw in our small shop. And it was a big pain to use. It had a motor with a little reset button. And if you overloaded it, that reset button would trip all the time. And it was just not the right tool for a production shop. It was at least a belt drive machine. This is a direct drive machine and direct drive machines, you know, have limitations on the number of horsepower they can be because the motor is mounted onto the blade and it's a direct uh, motor to the blade connection as opposed to the motor being separate and behind or below and being driven by a belt to drive the blade. And that means that the motor has to be higher up and, and travel with the blade and travel in a closer relationship to the tabletop. And you can only get the motors for the direct drive machines to be so big before they start interfering with the functions of the machine. So usually the higher end machines, the cabinet saws, the big production shop saws, they're all belt driven. That gives you the opportunity for bigger motors, more power, more horsepower, more everything. But this one doesn't have that. When I started working at the college where I graduated from, we upgraded to a Grizzly cabinet saw. I was really happy with that. It was a huge, huge improvement over the Craftsman table saw. Now at work, we have a saw stop at the college I currently work for. Grizzly is a decent brand. There's nothing wrong with them. And their, their bigger ca uh, cabinet saws are really quite robust. We had a big, nice 48 inch wide fence for it. And, uh, Pumper Doodles wants to make a cameo, so Pumper Doodles gets a cameo. And I also bought a foldable outfeed table with rollers on it, and that was always kind of nice to have that. You you have the table, the outfeed table is there when you need it. When you don't need it, it's boom, it's out of the way. That works really well for a small shop. They don't really mount onto this type of uh, machine. They kind of need a cabinet to mount onto. This one doesn't have a cabinet. This has the you know, kind of a freestanding uh, uh, in between a job site saw and a cabinet saw. That's what this one would be. We're going to crank the blade up. I'm going to be cutting two by four. I've got a couple practice cuts to make. And you can see right away from the blade coming up that I do not have a ripping blade on this machine. I have a blade on here that I was using to cut Baltic birch plywood for some cabinets in the kitchen. And I put on this 82 Tenryu 10 degree rake blade. And I had some pretty wonderful cuts from this piece of crap table saw from the 1970s. So the blade is your savior with a crappy table saw. So have the right blade. If this doesn't work, we're going to have to think of something else. But I'm gonna try this and see how this goes. So you guys all know the rule of blade height is that the blades are manufactured in such a way so that the, the gullet should be at the top of your wood. That's to help all of the chips and stuff fall out. And especially for ripping, it helps uh, make the blade go in the right downward direction and actually do the ripping the way it's supposed to be. If you have your blade too low, then it's going to start wanting to lift your wood up. I've got the wrong blade on here. I've got an underpowered saw for cutting two by four. One of my compensations is I raise the blade up higher. I know that that means I'm actually defeating the purpose of the shape and size and design of the blade for its optimal cutting. But because 
this angle is getting steeper as the blade comes up. I find that with an underpowered saw, I actually can get better performance because the saw doesn't have to work as hard as when the angle is lower. So I'm going to probably be cutting everything up pretty much at maximum here to get uh, the best possible cut. I think I just bottomed out there. I'm gonna back it off a turn or two just so I'm not interfering with the inside of the machine with the motor or anything like that. We're gonna do some practice cuts on a two by four, see how it behaves. The crappy thing about this ripping fence that comes with these Craftsman saws is it doesn't automatically align. So when we actually do cuts that matter, we're going to measure here in the front of the blade, and we're going to measure here in the back of the blade, and we're going to make sure that it's exactly where we want. All right, we're going to see what happens with this. <laughs> So you can see I have to cut pretty slowly because I don't have the right blade on there. If I had a ripping blade, it might be going a little bit faster, but even so, going through a two by four stock on this machine is kind of pushing the limits of this lower end home user table saw. But I'm happy with the cut. I was able to do it. This is pine. I'm going to be cutting in hardwood poplar and I'm gonna be cutting an eight foot length of two by six down to four inches and we're gonna see what happens, but I'm gonna do a couple more practice cuts out of a two by six to get my measurement exactly right. That is, a, like I said, a really crappy ripping fence. I'm just not going to invest in a better ripping fence for a table saw that I use uh, a lot less than I use at my uh, workshop in the theater scene shop. <laughs> Pretty happy with that. I'm a fraction of an inch shy of where I want to be, so I'm going to adjust it a tiny bit. The direct drive saw takes forever to spin down. We have to wait for that. Never reach in and grab your lumber and get your fingers close to that spinning blade. It is not a saw stop table saw. It will not know a dang thing if I come into contact with the blade and it won't protect me. This board has a split, so I may not be able to get a good accurate measurement, but I'm going to try. Okay, I'm happy with that. That's where I want it to be. I got four inches here. Here's my piece of poplar. 
two by six. I need it two by exactly four. So one and a half inches by four inches. So that was uh, by was pushing the limits of this saw. You notice I'm going even slower than I was in the pine because this is hardwood and it's a little bit denser and the saw is having a little bit of trouble keeping up with the wood and what I'm trying to do. I'm almost at the halfway point and at the halfway point, I'm going to walk around to the backside and pull it through. And again, I don't recommend you do that. I'm doing it at my home. I'm taking full responsibility for my actions. If it kicks back, I'm on the other side. There's no one over here. It's going to go flying into the shop. I'm not going to be in danger of kickback hurting me, but it could kick back. If I feel comfortable, this is not a heavy piece of wood. I probably could balance it, but by the time I get to the end here, it's gonna be a little bit precarious on the balance. So that's about as far as I'm comfortable. You can see it was already moved, it's shifted around, and this is where you lose your accuracy, and it takes a little bit of finagling to be good at this, but it's not going to be the most accurate solution. My cut, my cut looks good. I'm pretty much four inches everywhere I want to be. I'm happy with that. This would have been so much easier with a ripping blade. I thought I might have had a ripping blade in the garage. I don't. I only have this one blade for the table saw. I took off the rusty old piece of crap and threw it away when I put this one on. And uh, I guess I don't have a ripping blade. I really should get a ripping blade because this would be a lot easier with a ripping blade, not this 80 tooth uh, plywood blade. So one more piece to cut and we'll do the same thing. This is scrap, this is the piece I want.
And there you have it. I overpowered my machine. I tripped the circuit breaker. It's not happy about that. What's probably happening is this board is starting to pinch the blade. Uh, I should probably try and cut this kerf again and try to widen that uh, where it's pinching over here, widen it up a little bit. And uh, I could do that, but I'm gonna just flip the board around, see if I can get a better cut from the other end. And it's actually pinching worse from this end. All right. Back to the other end. I had a helper here, which I should have had. They can pull us apart and prevent that binding. Success with some finagling. And I'm still holding strong at four inches all along the length of the board. And that's only because I've done this unsafe technique a lot and figured out how to do it and maintain my accuracy. But I guarantee most people try this and they're going to get a very inaccurate and wobbly cut and you're gonna be very unhappy with it. Best to get yourself a helper, get yourself a catcher, get someone to catch the wood and support it so you can properly push it through the entire length of the way.
if you're ripping with a panel saw, a big sheet of plywood, that, that's actually allowed to, you push it halfway through and then you come around to the other side and you pull it the rest of the way through. You don't use push sticks in a panel saw, that's not actually safe. But this isn't a panel saw, this is a table saw, so I really should be pushing the entire length of the way through. I could have also rigged up some sort of support out there. Sometimes I've done that with some tables and things and helped uh, provide some support. And uh, this was a bit of a real tough challenge for this saw and pushing it beyond its limits, especially with that uh, 80 tooth blade that's designed for combination and plywood work. That's what I do to compensate for an underpowered saw when I have to do some beefy things with it. I wouldn't recommend doing any of these things with a cordless table saw. It's just, you've got to get yourself a better saw if you're trying to cut some hardwood stock that's as thick as this. And I'm done with it, so I'm going to take that blade all the way down below the surface before I put it away. Safety first. I've got a ripping blade for the saw now, so we're going to do a test cut with that same 2 by stock poplar and see if the ripping blade makes it any easier for this old piece of craft craftsman table saw. But before I do that, I wanted to demonstrate and show some cuts in Baltic birch plywood with the 80 tooth blade before I take it off. The first thing we're going to do is cut this 3 quarter inch plywood and I'm going to set the blade to the right height. Right about there, the deepest gullet is at the top of the plywood. Just going to cut a thin strip off. All right, there's my cross cut with the 80 tooth blade. We've got a really clean cut on that top of that cross cut for this laminate surface. That was with the 80 tooth blade. I've got a little bit of tear out on the bottom and that's to be expected. That's the underside of the Baltic birch, the less good side and the side that would go down. But uh, you can see that 80 tooth blade does really, really well uh, with the cross cut. Now we're going to do a ripping cut on this plywood and this is half inch so I got to lower the blade. Just take a little strip off. And we can see the ripping cut is actually very, very good on both sides. Nice and clean. This is the underside. So even with this crappy, crappy table saw, I can actually produce good cuts with the right blade. Let's change out the blade. So before we change out the blade, first thing we do is unplug the tool. Safety first. This table saw comes with this really unusual shaped insert. It's really non-standard. So if you do need to have a zero kerf insert, you're gonna to have to manufacture your own. They, you won't be able to find anything that will fit this. I've also damaged this. My saw was sitting outside for a few years and it was rusting. And when I was trying to undo this screw recently, I sheared off the screw and I haven't had time to drill that out and tap it out, but it still works just fine. It's got this little spring that snaps into place here and holds it into place. And this missing screw holding it down snug so it doesn't pop up. But I've just been working with it and keeping it secure, making sure my wood holds it down and it hasn't been going anywhere. Soon I'll get that cleaned up and fixed. I'll lower the blade down because it's a little bit easier to change the blades when the blade is lower.
There's not a lot of room for your hands in this table saw insert. Being a non-standard size, it's a little bit smaller than most. This is that 80 tooth blade. It does have a lot of pitch and gum buildup. It does need a cleaning right now, but it would perform so much better if I did that. And this blade is the Tenryu 10 by 80 tooth PR25580D. And I'm replacing it with the Tenryu RS25524CBN ripping blade, a 24 tooth ripping blade. Do a test run. It's good. We can see the kind of cut I got on the last pass with the 80 tooth blade. There's a little bit of burning, there's some marking, there's some more marking here in the middle, and some more burning, and some more burning. So it's it's not the best cut with that 80 tooth blade. With the new blade, I'm gonna take it up all the way again because I think my saw is underpowered. I know my saw is underpowered. I want to give it the most possible power cut as possible. That's bottomed out, so I'm backing it out at half a turn or a turn. I'm not going to need the push stick because I'm going to do a safer version. So instead of pushing it all halfway through, running around the backside and pulling it the rest of the way, this time I'm going to go halfway through. I'm going to pull it out, flip it around, and do the other half. And that is actually the safer method if you don't have an outfeed table, if you don't have a second person helping you catch, if you can't rig uh, some sort of outfeed support, then this will be your safest solution to get your long boards cut. Go halfway through, pull it out, flip it over, and run the other half. You will get some markings in the middle of the board where the first and the second cut meets. That's to be expected. Whenever you flip a board on any machine, you're not going to get 100% accurate cut or it's gonna be hard to get 100% accurate cut and you're gonna have some cleanup to do. You're not gonna get a perfectly smooth cut with a table saw anyway. There's gonna be some scratches from the blade. You're gonna be running this through a jointer or sanding it or planing it or doing some work with your finished product, you're going to have some additional work on it anyway. If you're doing something that's not a, a visual member, but it's a hidden structure, this is gonna be perfect for you. So it's not gonna matter if it's a little bit sloppy in the middle, but we're gonna do the best we can to make that cut work. This is my cleanest edge. Even though it's the side I cut last time, it's a cleaner edge. The other one has some variation. It thins off there and it uh, thins off on the other end. It's a little thicker in the middle. So I'm going to cut that way. much better than that 82 plywood blade. So much better. 
even this crappy underpowered table saw can produce good ripping cuts with the right ripping blade. Here's that middle where our two pieces met. And actually, it's not that bad. That's uh, stuff that, that could easily be sanded and planed and cleaned up. I am getting a lot of scratch marks on this. And I'm getting a lot of scratch marks because my saw doesn't have a riving knife or a splitter. The board is kind of shifting in towards the teeth and is getting uh, uh, scratched on all those upstrokes. And that's, again, because I don't have a splitter that's the same width as the kerf of the blade. If I had that riving knife or splitter, I'd probably get a cleaner cut. I know that I'm not using that feature on this saw, and I'm accepting the quality of the cut that I'm getting as a result. Without that riving knife in place, the boards can come in and pinch on the blade, and that can cause some chatter and some vibration. And it can also cause some lifting of the wood on that end because the splitter is designed to prevent the boards from pinching on the blade. You're gonna have less likely of any sort of lift if you're actually using all of your safety features at your table saw, including the splitter or the riding wood. As you can see, this is, there's no burn marks whatsoever here. No burn marks. When I was pulling my board through, you notice I, I lifted it up and out. And that is a dangerous task. That is a dangerous action. I could stop the saw. I probably should have stopped the saw and wait, waited for the blade to come to a complete stop. But also stopping the saw means that I'm bending over, my wood's wiggling. I'm probably gonna put some additional marking and scratching in the lumber. I may not be happy with that end result. But in order to make this safer, I don't wanna just lift out and kind of go all over and place into the blade. What I'm doing is I'm pivoting on this point and I'm just pivoting straight out. And that's gonna get me the cleanest and safest method of extraction possible. So get yourself a good ripping blade, even with your underpowered cheap table saw. I, I could have even taken this down and set it at blade at the right height and it would have performed just fine. This saw would have performed great at that height with the ripping blade. The ripping blade made all the difference. Get yourself the right blade for the right cuts. And even this cheap craftsman table saw, this piece of crap table saw will perform amazingly with the right blade. always putting that saw blade back into the table before I put it away. I cut this footage out of the earlier demonstration because it immediately illustrates the dangers of letting go of your stock, even for a brief time. While the lumber did not kick back on me, things could have escalated to a major kickback quickly. I misjudged the center of my eight foot long board and the lumber was balancing precariously for several seconds until I regained control of the stock. Any movement of the lumber at this point could have resulted in a violent kickback. Performing this task without a splitter or a riving knife also increased that risk. And on a related note, it also reinforces why freehand cutting on the table saw can be dangerous. All of the additional movement of the lumber also meant the cut is going to have more imperfections as it shifts around and comes in contact with the blade until I regain control and return it to the position against the rip fence and flat on the table, the blade is going to further damage the stock. Depending on the purpose of the cut, this may result in additional planing, jointing, and sanding to get the desired finish. My application is closer to rough carpentry even though I'm using poplar hardwood. The imperfections will not affect the project I am doing. Again, although I demonstrated this method in this video, I am absolutely not recommending anyone actually let go of the lumber, go around, and finish the cut by pulling the saw through for the second half. Please build an outfeed table, enlist the help of a catcher, or flip the board after passing the halfway point. These are your safer options.